Hello and welcome to the Book Club Review. I'm Kate. I'm Laura. And this is the podcast about book clubs and the books that get people talking. Today, we bring you an interview with publisher Jacques Testard of Fitzcarraldo Editions, described in The Guardian as the little publisher that could. In 2014, Jacques started his publishing house with a staff of one, himself, and an ambition to publish 10 books over the course of two years. Today, Fitzcarraldo has grown to a staff of six and publishes the work of four Nobel Prize winning authors and has become firmly established in the literary landscape as a reliable source of excellence. Behind the publisher's distinctive blue or white covers lie works of ambition, imagination, and innovation. And yet with no striking cover image to guide you, these books can perhaps seem a little mysterious or even intimidating. So today we take you behind the scenes to discover what the Fitzcarraldo list is all about. To help us along, we're joined by Sam McCausland, friend of our dear friend and regular guest, Phil Chafee, and recommended to us by Phil as a Fitzcarraldo aficionado. And so we're delighted to have him join us to talk about some of his favorites. That's all coming up here on the Book Club Review. Sam, welcome. It's lovely to have you with us. And apart from being friend of Phil, tell us a little about yourself. What are you doing when you're not reading books? Well, thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you very much for having me. In my day job, I work in PR and communications. Aside from reading books, Phil and I have a walking club. So we like once a month to go on a big walk outside of London. And we're often discussing exactly these books by Fitzgerald. Perfect. Well, I thought we'd attempt something a little different today, which is to listen to the interview and try and pick up and comment on various things that Jacques raises as we go through. I should also say that I recorded this interview with Jacques some months ago now. I love doing it so much and I have slightly hoarded it ever since, never getting quite to the point where I felt ready to record the rest of the episode and release it to the world. But the news of Fitzcarraldo author Annie Erno winning the Nobel Prize recently, plus Fitzcarraldo celebrating publishing their 100th book, made me realise the time was now. And so Laura and Sam, are you ready to dive in and hear how Jacques got started? Let's do it. Absolutely. Let's go. I set up Fitzcarraldo in 2014, having worked on the margins of publishing for a few years. I set up a literary magazine in 2010 with a good friend from university, Ben Easton. We met in Dublin at Trinity College and set up a magazine called The White Review. And I guess Fitzgerald was born out of our work on The White Review. We set up the magazine to publish ambitious, innovative writing and new writers, emerging writers, poetry, criticism. And also we had a keen interest in contemporary art. All the while running the White Review with Ben, I was trying to get jobs in mainstream publishing and failing. I was often told that I was too qualified for editorial assistant positions, even though I'd never had a job in publishing, which was quite frustrating. Eventually, after a few years, I got a job as a commissioning editor at a small press called Notting Hill Editions, where I learned to publish books. Notting Hill was a publishing house that focuses on the long-form essay. So I got to commission some writers like Deborah Levy, Things I Don't Want to Know, was actually the first book I ever commissioned. Oh, wow. And an American novelist called Joshua Cohen. I did a book of his called Attention, A Short History, now part of a bigger book that we ended up doing at Fitzgeraldo. But so I learned how to publish books at Notting Hill and had a mentor of sorts, Paul Keegan, who was the editorial director who gave me this job and taught me to get a book from the point where you commission through to publication. And then to cut a long story short, the owner of Notting Hill, a man called Tom Kramer, ended up sacking everyone. Fraught and complicated story. But I ended up in, it was I think December 2013, without a job, still running The White Review, which is a charity and a little magazine and not something that we ever took money out of. Essentially needing a job and wondering what to do. And at that point, I was given the opportunity to maybe start a press of my own on a very, very small scale. That was a very scary and daunting thing because, as I keep repeating, I knew how to make a book, but I had no idea how to sell one or market one. I didn't really know about sales and distribution and all of that stuff. So I really thought about it for a couple of months, made a list of the publishing houses that I could imagine myself working at at that point in London, where I've lived for a long time, and 
it was a very short list and there were no jobs at any of them anyway. So partly out of a lack of other options, partly because I had someone essentially willing to lend me some money to give it a go, I decided I would try and start a publishing house. Really on a very small scale, though, I cannot overemphasize how small it was to begin with. I was working on my own full time. I had enough money to begin with to pay myself a salary to work full time and to keep paying rent in London and to publish 10 books. The first year I published six books, three fiction, three nonfiction. And the idea was to start small and see how it went. And now seven and a half years on is, yeah, I could not have predicted that we would be where we are. I know we're not supposed to be talking about Deborah Levy, but that you published that first memoir of hers. So it just kind of confirms to me something that I had been thinking, looking at the books that you published, which is you've just got such an eye for spotting this talent, I think, when it comes your way. How do you feel about Deborah Levy and the way that essay series has gone since then? She's amazing. And I think at the point where we talked about doing that book and then she ended up writing it, she just had her big success with Swimming Home after, I think, 10 years of not publishing. Her star was rising, so I was not in any way involved in what has happened to her career subsequently but her writing seemed to me at the point where I encountered it to be very exciting and unusual and not something that was frequent in literary publishing at least not in the mainstream. Deborah and I are still in touch and I read her books avidly. I also interviewed her for the White Review. We do long writer and artist interviews. I think that's how I first really got to know her work well as I read everything and spent you know three hours talking to her in her writing shed. Which I know all about because of course she frequently reflects on it when she's writing those books. I mean, it's just, I think there's a kind of electric quality to that non-fiction writing of hers, those auto-fiction books, that I think has struck a chord with so many more people, perhaps, than the fiction, which is, that's what I found really interesting about that side of her writing. And you were there at the very beginning. How interesting. Anyway, we're not talking about Deborah Levy, we're talking about Fitzcarraldo. And the name Fitzcarraldo? The name was a problem for me. At the beginning of the process of setting up a publishing house, I knew very early on what I wanted to do. I wanted to publish fiction and I wanted to publish nonfiction and I wanted to publish work in translation as well. And that's how the list was going to break down. Early on, I also knew what the first couple of books would be, Matthias in our zone, translated by Charlotte Mandel and also Simon Critchley's Memory Theatre, which was an original English language book. But I was going to meetings with agents and publishers saying I'm starting a publishing house. Here was the font that the art director and designer Ray Amara had already designed, but there was no name for the press. I just became stuck on that. One evening when it was getting quite desperate, I think we were five months away from launching, I decided to look through all of my favorite books on my bookshelves. And one of the first books I opened was Limanov by Emmanuel Carrere. And I opened the book at random and landed on the page where Carrere interviews Werner Herzog at Cannes Film Festival in 1982 or three, I think, about Fitzcarraldo. And remembered at that point that Fitzcarraldo is one of my favorite films. So the name, if you've seen the film, is a not very subtle metaphor on the stupidity of setting up a publishing house because in the film, Klaus Kinski plays an opera mad, I guess he's kind of a madman, somebody he's just obsessed with opera and lives in Manaus in Brazil and he wants to build an opera house in the jungle and he persuades a tribe of American Indians to drag his steamboat over one meander of the Amazon to another. So there's an hour-long scene in the film where these people are dragging a steamboat up a hill and it's 220 tons and it's really difficult task obviously so yeah there's that element of madness the folly of setting up a publishing house Mm. and also it's supposed to signal a willingness to take risks and to publish books that other publishers might not be interested in doing or that are perceived to be too difficult by the mainstream and they have such a specific design aesthetic for anyone not in the uk anyone who might not be familiar with them do you want to describe them for us We publish in two series, so our fiction series, those have blue covers, typographical covers only, so there's just text on the cover. The font is called Fitzcarraldo and was designed by Ray O'Mara. The essay series, which has grown to encompass all kinds of nonfiction, is the reverse design, so it's white covers with blue text. I guess the inspiration for the design was very much 20th century continental publishing, French publishers like Gallimard and Minuit. And I'm French originally and grew up with those books at home and reading those books. Also German, a German publisher like Zorkam, Adelphi in Italy. We looked at presses in the UK too, like Bodley Head, when they published Ulysses, for example, the first edition of Ulysses they did. 
is a very similar minimalist aesthetic. Mm. And the idea with the design, it was partly a reaction against what Ray and I still agree is, I guess, a kind of tendency in UK book design to try and literally interpret a book's content on its cover. And that leads to lots of bad design. And I guess we wanted to let the text speak for themselves. I think there's also kind of democratic element to the design in that everyone is presented in exactly the same way. So a debut author will be presented in the same way as a Nobel Prize winner, not that we knew we would be publishing Nobel Prize winners at the beginning. And also because there is a very recognizable aesthetic that is different from other publishers in the UK, I guess this kind of design is the exception here, not the norm, whereas in France it's very much the norm. We were hoping that by publishing books of a very high literary quality, by publishing books that were unusual, that pushed boundaries in style, form, genre, whatever it is, and by maintaining that quality across the list, we would perhaps attract a loyal readership who might trust us enough to want to read a book by someone that they've never heard of because we've published it. So I think that was very much Ray's idea from the beginning. <laughs> It can't have been easy in the beginning once the novelty of these books had worn off, but overall it does seem Fitzcarraldo is flourishing and it does seem that his strategy of building a brand and building brand loyalty has paid off. Sam, do you follow them? How do you feel about it? I think that's absolutely right. I'll confess that I first became aware of Fitzcarraldo not because of anything they've published, but because I saw the covers out and about. It was almost like a fashion accessory, particularly the white ones, actually. My first thought was, oh gosh, Look at those matte white covers that seem just like plain paper. How do people keep them clean? Particularly when it's a 700-page <laughs> novel and you're carting around essentially a blank piece of paper on the cover. And the answer is you don't. I can see even, even around the studio now there are, <laughs> there are white covers that are full of marks. Mine are exactly the same. So I was intrigued by these books. And like a fashion accessory, I thought I want one. So I picked up a book we might discuss a bit later, Secondhand Time, and found the subject matter extraordinarily daunting but compelling. Since then, I've really been hooked. At one point, I even had a subscription where Fitzcarraldo would send me whatever they publish in fiction, nonfiction, whatever it is. And for about six months, I was sent such a wide variety of books I would never have chosen otherwise. Some of which were great, some of which were really completely unapproachable and I couldn't get on with at all. But it was really a really fantastic experience. My feeling is that with these distinctive covers, Jacques is really leaning into something that other businesses do, other brands do by default, which is to create a community. And kind of a brand promise, right? These titles have been carefully curated and selected and endorsed. And for that reason, you should trust the publisher to bring you something delightful. And then, as Sam says, you could literally join the club by subscribing. I love that. I love that so much. And I don't know why more publishers don't do it. I do think it's really interesting, this idea of the purely typographic cover as well. We are so used to being told so much about a book and the contents of a book from the way the publishers choose to present it to us, whether that's some illustration or a photograph. But you get so much of a sense of what a book is like from that image that the publishers choose to brand it with. In a way, it's daunting picking up a Fitzcarraldo book. Until you read it, you do not know what you're going to get. But it's also quite exciting to really come to it without any preconceptions. I think so. It's daunting for the reader, but it must be so much more daunting for the author. Imagine if you're a first author and your book is going out into the world without the help of an image to market its readers. It's going on the strength of the publisher. That's a huge amount of trust to put in someone like Jack to sell your book properly. And yet this minimalist brand does seem to work, doesn't it? Over time, you start to realise, yes, this strategy of building this identity and this kind of reassurance that you know, to some extent, what you're going to get when you open a Fitzcarraldo book. You don't know what the subject or the kind of writing is going to be. That's always going to be a surprise. But there's something they all have in common, which is this certain quality... <laughs> Sort of uh, excellence. Yeah. <laughs> I think equality, a seriousness, a seriousness about what literature is and what it should be and what it should be doing. That's something that's common to all of their books. And you do feel part of a club if you pick up a Fitzcarraldo book. You feel part of a bit of a culture of reading these books, which makes you feel, you know, fun. All right, let's get back into it. Next up, I asked Jack, with all the books and writers that there are in the world, how is it that he finds the ones he wants to publish? And we get to learn about the Jacques Testard Whisper Network. I think we're starting to get better at reading fiction in translation here in the UK. But I'm still very conscious that there are vast swathes of 
European literature about which I know nothing. How do you find the books that you want to publish? We work closely with publishers around the world, publishers publishing in their own languages, obviously, and they would send us books that they thought might be a fit for the catalogue. I also have developed over the years, and this is very common to any editor or publisher who translates anything, I've developed a network of like-minded editors and publishers, mainly in Europe and in America too, who we share authors with, obviously across languages. We recommend things to each other, and there's a kind of whisper network that is very active, particularly around the book fairs. We also work very closely with translators. Translators are scouts of sorts. The ones that I've worked with tend to know what my taste is or what my colleague Tamara's taste is. She's the other editor at Fitzgeraldo. And they will recommend things to us that they think might be a fit. But I guess also now that we're seven years in, one of the things I was very keen to do from the start is to take authors on and publish them over time. At the beginning, obviously, it was a blank canvas because I was making it up as I went along and finding authors and books that I was excited to publish and was able to pick up these phenomenal world-class authors who weren't being published in the UK for whatever reason, like Matthias Sinar, like Svetlana Alexievich, like Olga Tokarczyk. Now that we are seven and a half years in, we've published many of these people more than once and have more books by them coming. So it's getting harder and harder to find space to bring on new authors, which is frustrating because that's one of the most fun parts of the job. And I think as we've started to read more books in translation, there's also a growing awareness of the importance of the translator and the role of the translator in bringing that text to the English language. How do you find the right translators? Good translators are first and foremost good writers. And I think translation is an art form. We've even published a book about this called This Little Art by Kate Briggs. It's through the experience and working with translators, you learn who the good ones are. And I guess there is obviously a craft element to it. Is someone going to be able to render this text in the best possible English? And as I said, it comes down to the quality of their writing, really. Some books come to us where the translator is pitching it and there's no question that someone else might do it. Sometimes we take on books without a translator attached. I mean, one example, and I guess this is kind of, you know, the extreme end, when we took on Adonia Shibley's Minor Details, she's a Palestinian author. We relied on Arabic readers to read the book for us and to write reports and recommend whether or not we should be publishing it. And there was no translator that Adonia wanted to work with at that point. So we commissioned samples from, I think, three different translators and then read and compared them and with the author ended up going with Elizabeth Jacket. So yeah, it really depends. One of the books I brought with me, I brought a few of my Fitzgerald books from home, is 50 Sounds by Polly Barton, who is a translator of Japanese. And it's a sort of memoir, but it's structured around different words in the Japanese language. And then that leads to this series of little essays on her own experiences and the nuances of those words and the meaning. And it's absolutely fascinating. Now, you've published not one, but two Nobel Prize winning authors, Svetlana Alexievich and more recently Olga Tokarczuk. And you're a small independent publisher. What kind of a difference has that made? A quick interjection from me at this point to say, as I mentioned earlier, that since we recorded this interview, Fitzgerald author Annie Ono won the Nobel. They also now publish the work of German author Elfried Jelinek, bringing their total of Nobel Prize winning authors to four. So yes, back to Jacques and the impact of all these Nobel Prize wins. It's been pretty massive, both in different ways. Svetlana Alexievich won the Nobel Prize in October 2015. I'd been publishing books for a year at that point. We hadn't even published 10 books. And I'd acquired the rights to her book Second Hand Time, which is her latest book and her biggest book a year before. And the astonishing thing with that is that her Nobel put Fitzgerald on the map because we were going to be the publisher that had the new book. But it also was a huge boost because we had the rights to the book in English around the world. And it meant I could sell the rights to an American publisher. And so this is kind of niche industry talk. But at my second ever Frankfurt Book Fair, I was holding an 11 or 12 way auction with American publishers. And it was all the big presses, and I ended up selling the book to Random House for a significant fee. And though most of the money goes to the author, there is a cut for the publisher. And essentially, it was a validation of the editorial line and a kind of subsidy to carry on. And that success, just that right sale alone, 
enabled me to employ someone to work with me for the first time part time. I think we went up from eight books a year to ten the next year or something. That book, Secondhand Time, is a seven hundred page oral history about the nostalgia for the Soviet Union and the collapse of the Soviet Union, people's worlds vanishing overnight. And it's incredibly beautiful, incredibly well written. She spent twenty years writing it. It's an amazing, amazing book. But at the point where I acquired it, she was very successful in winning prizes in France, Spain, Germany, whatever, but completely unknown here.、Mm. And there was no guarantee whatsoever that the book was going to find an audience. But I guess I was interested in the book, so I thought it was a phenomenal piece of work, and it was heartening to have that experience of her winning the Nobel and being validated by success so early. With Olga, it was different again because the Nobel was the culmination of a series of unbelievable coincidences or happy events in the life of a book. I acquired two books of hers, Flights and the Books of Jacob. I think it was back in 2016, and Flights was going to be the first book of hers we published. And London Book Fair happened to have a Poland focus a couple of months before we were publishing. They brought Olga over, and she was made author of the day, which is the silly thing, but it meant that you know they organised some events. There was some early buzz around the book. A year later, she won the International Booker Prize. Six months later, we had a second book scheduled, which I'd bought in the interim period. Drive your plough over the bones of the dead. And the booker had already made her a big star in translated literature and in literature full stop, and she'd already become a best-selling author. And then, yeah, the Nobel was next level in terms of sales, in terms of reach. And again, we just sold more books than we were used to selling at the point where that happened. So that's been driving the growth of the publishing house. We used to be. A very chaotic, very small independent press with two people, and now there are six of us. And I guess we're trying to be as professional as possible. I'd like to talk about those books a little bit more. Just to go back to Svetlana Alexievich, I have read Secondhand Time. I think that's the first Fitzcarraldo book I read because we did it for my book club. I think probably when she won the Nobel, and I think someone in my book club said, "Oh, we should read this author," because it's not an obvious choice for book club.、Yeah. But I think sometimes book club can be great for. Getting you to read things that you wouldn't normally pick up, and also with a big book like that, giving you that little bit of a push you might need to get through it. It is the most extraordinary book, and it's very much been on my mind with the news in Russia at the minute. Once you've read that book, it can't be abstract. They're so vivid; these little, they're kind of interviews, aren't they? But she just brings them to life so incredibly that you feel you're living each one with the person that she's talking to. And the experiences that these people have, the things that they went through—it's an extraordinary book. I don't know how else to kind of sell it to people to try and read it, but it's incredible, isn't it? It's an amazing book and unique. And I think she has perfected oral history as a literary form, really, as a way to, I guess, tell epic stories. It contains many lives, and also I think gets at the heart of. The Russian soul. I think she writes about that in her introduction, and I guess that's something that Russian language authors have been trying to do for centuries, back to Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, etc. So I think she's very much a writer inventing her own form, but taking on the universal themes and doing so admirably. And yet, as you mentioned, the book's been on my mind too with the invasion of Ukraine. And Svetlana was born in what is now Ukraine and is Belarusian and has lived. In Minsk for most of her life, though she's been in exile in Germany for a year or two now. You also were wondering about translators before, and that book was translated by Belashayevich. And at the point where I acquired the book, because it's such a long book, it's such a difficult book, it's quite sad. It's tough material at times to grapple with. I actually asked four, five, six prominent Russian translators to do the book, and none of them wanted to or could. Partly was the length, you know, they just didn't think they could fit it in, and I ended up being introduced to Bella, who'd never translated a book before. Had done bits and bobs for magazines like N Plus One, and she did an incredible job on on that book. And Olga Tokarczuk, I haven't read Flights, but Drive Your Plough Over the Bones of the Dead, also I did for book club. I think this is an excellent book club book because it's very readable. It's got a brilliant, unforgettable heroine. This elderly woman. Living in the forests, she's quite isolated, and then there's these strange deaths that are happening around where she lives, and it's tied up with issues to do with hunting and the land and conservation. And so, on the one hand, you've got what feels a little bit conventional, you know, this sort of thriller plot, but then it's 
interwoven all these really interesting ideas and this language where every sentence gives you something. I felt exhilarated and a wonderful discussion book because it's so rich. What did you feel when you first came across this one? I think what's really fascinating with Olga and her writing is that she's one of those writers who is completely different with every book. And Drive Your Plow is, I think, her very successful attempt at subverting the straight up detective novel with an unreliable narrator, Yanina Jashaiko, and kind of threading in other themes like the environment, like hunting, animal rights, that kind of stuff. Astrology, the title is taken from a William Blake poem, and the narrator is a translator of William Blake into Polish. So it's a really fascinating book. As you say, it's a page turner. She absolutely wanted to write a book that could be read in that kind of straightforward, plotty way, but also playing with the form. I guess it really made sense in publishing terms after Flight, which is, again, a very different book, slightly more experimental in form, which jumps between lots of different stories over time to publish this book and also to give Jennifer Croft, who translated Flight's and Books of Jacob, the time to work on Books of Jacob because that's an extremely long book. Sam, have you read the Books of Jacob? I haven't read the books of Jacob. It's one of those books that's staring at me on my shelf intimidatingly, but I love Olga's other works. I've read her two others published by Fitzcarraldo, Drive Your Plow, and also Flights. And there's one other book that she published, I think only in America. It's a lesser known work, a kind of folktale about a village and its history through time. She is an amazing writer. I feel like Drive Your Plow might have been the book that really pushed Fitzcarraldo from being highbrow aspirational, niche literary reading into something relatively mainstream. And I know certainly for me, I was really, wow, what else do they publish? You know, this is great. Yeah, I think that's right. As Jack said, it's a detective story at heart, but it has this deep kind of oddness. Olga gravitates towards these slightly unusual characters on the fringes of society. And it's the seriousness with which she takes them their groundedness in characters that you can relate to, despite slightly bizarre or very unusual perspectives that I think makes it so compelling. And like you with Olga Tokarczuk, I have had a copy of The Years by Annie Erno sitting on my shelf unread for a long, quite a long time now. So I was intrigued enough, this is before she won the Nobel, I was intrigued enough by her to want to pick up and get a copy, but I haven't actually got around to reading it. And now, of course, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I must, I, I feel like, is The Years the one, if you want to read Annie Erno, is that the one to go for? I think The Years is really her opus. It's certainly her biggest book by a long, long way. And it probably has the grandest scope. It takes, uh, what, 60 years of history, more, in fact, and condenses it into her perspective of a girl growing up in France in a small town, but somehow also universalizes it. She doesn't use the expression I anywhere in the novel. It's all we, this happened to us. And it's a universal perspective of what it was like to be living in France in each of the years that she looks at from about the 1940s to the 2000s. I have dipped in and I did find the little bits I read immediately very engaging, actually. So I do think when I do read it, I'm pretty sure I will enjoy it. But I was talking about it with someone who said he's French and he said, I just don't know if you didn't have that background, if you didn't have that knowledge of French society and French history, what you would get from this? I mean, what was your experience? That's a really interesting question. And I think that goes across actually all of Erno's work. It's very particular, her perspective. Her story about an affair is not about any affair that a woman could have. It's very specific to a time and place and her own perspective. But it's the acute, tiny observations, which she can somehow make universal, perhaps through the form that really elevates it into something else. And maybe that's why The Years is kind of, if you like, a classic Fitzcarraldo book, in that it, it takes a perspective and a way of writing that is slightly unusual and fashions it into this new literary form of looking at each year in isolation through certain objects or memories or shared experiences, creating a new form like that that only works for one particular novel at one particular point in time. And her other books are significantly shorter, aren't they? And they seem to be all written in this quite fragmentary style. It's fragmentary, it's confessional, it, it's autofiction, so you don't know what's true and what's not, but it often feels like you're listening into a diary or a journal or chance reflections. But again, they're about things that anyone can relate to, whether that's having an affair in one of them. Exteriors, one of her more recent books, is about the changing perspectives in a suburban community as the 20th century rushes past it. Laura, am I right in thinking that you 
were in my book club when we read Secondhand Time by Svetlana Alexievich? Yes, that was my first Fitzcarraldo book I ever owned. And has that stayed with you? I remember it was such a powerful read. Yeah, no, it has stayed with me. And I think in some ways it may have given me a false impression, though, of the Fitzcarraldo list because it is dense and challenging and beautiful, but very much, coming back to the word challenging, I think, both in terms of form, also subject matter. And I think we're going to come to it later, but I've since read further into the list and I feel like there is more range there. Okay, let's go back to Jacques. I mentioned on Instagram that I was going to be interviewing you and a few people commented with things, you know, that they were curious about. And one person said to me, why are all the books so sad? And I was reading an interview with you online that you did with Lit Hub, I think it was, and I'd read, you said it yourself earlier, the first book we published was Matthias Inard's Zone, a 521-page stream-of-consciousness novel written in one sentence about violent conflict in the Mediterranean during the 20th century, translated from French by Charlotte Mandel. I mean, that's not an obvious book that anyone would want to read. I sort of love the fact that you thought that was great and immediately, yes, I must publish this, but you know, what are you looking for? What are you drawn to in these books? That's a very hard question to answer. I guess the starting point and the thing that I always have in mind when considering something for Fitzcarraldo, and I think it's the same for my colleague Tamara, is, is this book doing something interesting with language? Is there something in the style, in the way the author writes their sentences? Is there something formally interesting in this book? Is it pushing boundaries of genre? We publish a lot of books that could have had blue covers or white covers because they're kind of in the intersection between fiction and nonfiction and sometimes other genres too. I guess, yeah, we're interested in writing that's at the cutting edge and that's also incredibly precise. Style is always going to be the thing that gets us. I think whatever a book is about, as long as the author is writing it in beautiful enough sentences and interesting enough form, then that will be enough to get our attention. But to address the sadness, I don't know, I studied history, I almost did a PhD in history. And I think one of the things I'm interested in, and I guess you see it in Matthias in book and in Svetlana Alexievich, a bit in Olga in Aniono for sure. There's an interest in history and memory that kind of goes across the list. And this is maybe revealing too much, but I did my MA on collective memory in France at the end of the 19th century. So I guess I, yeah, I'm really interested in that kind of stuff. I don't know. I mean, the world is dark and sad. We do also publish slightly lighter things too on occasion. But I guess, yeah, we're interested in, for lack of a better way of putting it, serious books. And I guess there's also an interest in politics and in publishing books that are addressing the world around us, the world we live in. And I guess a kind of old school-ish conception of the publisher is contributing to the discourse and to the shifting of ideas. Publisher as contributing to the discourse. What do we think of that idea? It feels fairly at odds with the commercially driven motives we can ascribe to most publishers I can think of. It's quite refreshing. Yeah, I think it's interesting that Fitzcarraldo is a publishing house that emerged from a journal. It certainly had a ready-made perspective before it started picking up authors. And I've always wondered if Fitzcarraldo is more interested in fostering a kind of a literary culture in a way that you might associate with America or perhaps with Paris or, you know, with the salon culture of the past that maybe we're missing in the UK a little bit. Yes, that was my thought, that it feels distinctly French. And how lucky are we that it happens to be an English language publisher. So we get a sliver of that literary culture. There's some sense, isn't there? I do feel slightly, we let Jack down, you know. <laughs> we, I think as a culture, we <laughs> disappoint him. And he's like, I've got to do something about this. <laughs> and thank God he did. <laughs> and then from the 900 page Olga Tokarczuk to another recent release, Cold Enough for Snow by Jessica Au which has just come out and which is, what is it, 124? No, not even that. I think it's 104 pages yeah. possibly, yeah. And a very quiet book, mm. but nonetheless, I think quite a powerful one, again, touching on this idea of memory and in this case, a relationship between a mother and her daughter. And nothing much happens. They go traveling around Japan. It all seems quite innocuous every day. They do touristy things. And this one I didn't find sad. 
I actually thought it was a really lovely exploration of a relationship that we so much take for granted that we almost don't notice it. It's a gentle book, but I felt like it just touched on a lot of things and had a lot of resonance. It's a brilliant book. And I guess just to kind of zoom out a little bit, the Fifth Grotto catalogue, I guess we're more famous for translation. You know, Olga, Svetlana, uh, we've touched on already. But half of the books we publish are in the English language. You mentioned Polly Barton before and now Jessica Au. And for the English language writing, we tend to work with younger emerging writers. Again, there's still this interest in style, form, language that, that remains. But we have to be more creative in order to find the writers. Now it's a bit easier because they know to come to us, but partly because we don't have the financial means to compete with the big publishers on agented submissions, etc. Cold Enough for Snow came out of a novel prize that I set up. Originally, we had a novel prize focusing on Britain and Ireland, which published and unpublished writers could submit to. We ran that for two years. The two inaugural winners were Jeremy Cooper and Adam Mars-Jones. And then stupidly and naively, I thought it might be interesting to try and expand this novel prize and make it a global thing. So we partnered with an American publisher called New Directions, who we share a number of books with and who I think are the best and most interesting publisher in America and very much a model for Fitzcarraldo, except they've been going for almost 100 years. And Giramondo in Australia, again, a publishing house that we have a lot of affinities with. So we decided to invite writers from around the world to submit their manuscripts to all of us. We carved up in a very grandiose way, the world into territories that we would read from. So at Fitzgeraldo, we read everything that came from Europe and Africa. New Directions did the Americas. Giramondo did Asia and Australasia. And we received, this is the stupid thing about it, we received over 1,500 submissions. Bear in mind, these are you know full manuscripts. Wow. We were reading the entire thing. And we ended up finding Cold Enough for Snow by Jessica Rao, who had published a novel in Australia 10 years ago. She's an Australian writer with Chinese origins. And I think she's typically the kind of writer that we might not have read or considered had we not opened up submissions in this way. So these are the kinds of initiatives that, you know, both enable us to find authors and enable authors to find us which also force us to read things and to take the time to think about bringing new authors into the catalogue. In telling you this, I haven't really talked about the book at all, but I think you did it justice. It, it is, I guess, yeah, a quiet book in which not that much happens. It's the story of a mother and daughter who go on holiday in Tokyo, and it is about memory and identity and migration. And I guess I think Rachel Cusk is quite a useful, you know, author to compare her to there's a kind of suite of stories and i'm thinking about the outline trilogy specifically the narrator dives into and, and recounts someone like jim Lahiri, i know is, is someone jessica Al is, is really a big fan of and i think she was also trying to channel her interests in 20th century japanese literature too so people like kawabata and tanizaki i think were influences on her she's a writer who manages to say a lot with very little. I think a lot of what's in the book, it kind of remains unsaid and is in the shadows. And I guess the idea is to present prose that seems quite simple and lulls the reader into a full sense of security, but actually it's full of meaning and there's definitely a lot happening in between the lines. Laura, you've read Cold Enough for Snow, haven't you? How did you find it? Oh, I loved it. And it's a shout out to you that I have read it because you sent it over, I think, with a package of books. Once in a while, Kate does this for me, <laughs> listeners. Very lucky. The care package. And I adored it. I thought it was a wonderful book and a very easy read, which is slightly strange because nothing much happens. It's just this exquisite prose story about a mother and daughter wandering around Tokyo. They have both flown in from their respective homes to be together. And it's just this very subtle portrait of that relationship. I should say a grown-up daughter, and they're coming together to spend some time. And the observations of the daughter of her mother, really touching and something about it resonated with me, even though my relationship with my mother is very different to that. And I read it, I think, in one big gulp. Yeah, Jack compared it to the Outline Trilogy by Rachel Cusk, which I thought was a really interesting parallel. He points out that, that both novels, the real action happens in what isn't set. In the Outline Trilogy, it's particularly notable for the razor-sharp intelligence of this narrator. 
and there are constant instances where particularly men talk at her and she sits in silent judgment and it's all the things that you know she isn't saying judging these men that's the real meat of the book and similarly i think with cold enough for snow although it's a very different project it's the things that aren't said or can't be said between mother and daughter where all the tenderness of the relationship lies they don't share a first language and their experience of life is so foreign from each other that they find it difficult to communicate, except in this kind of unspoken way, as they trudge around an art gallery, one's engaged and one's perhaps less so. But they're both responding to the art in ways they can't communicate with each other. I was looking back over all the books I've read so far this year, and actually Cold Enough for Snow is, I think, in the running for favourite book of the year. We'll report in on that on our Roundup episode coming out in December. All right. Well, to finish off, I asked Jack about some of his favourites. But like any good parent, of course, he couldn't pick a favourite. And so he told me about a couple of recent releases he was excited about. Matthew Aiken's The Naked Don't Fear the Water is a work of narrative nonfiction. He's a Canadian journalist who has been living in Afghanistan for most of the last decade. This is his first book, and he is now a fluent diary speaker, having lived and reported from Afghanistan for a long time. And he has the unusual particularity of being half Japanese, I think, on his mum's side, and somehow that means he passes for Afghan. He looks like he could be Afghan. So that coupled with his fluent diary speaking meant that he was able in 2015 to go underground on the refugee trail with one of his best friends, an Afghan interpreter, who in the book is called Omar. Omar wants to leave Afghanistan because there are no opportunities. It's not a good place to be. And so they go on the refugee trail in the summer of 2015. Through the story of Matt and Omar, we get an insider's account of the experience of being a migrant and crossing borders and being conned by smugglers and crossing the Mediterranean on a rubber dinghy and being in the camp at Moria and then living in a squat in Athens. And I think what makes the book really incredible is that there is also, apart from beautiful writing and a gripping story, there's a reflection as well on the migrant condition and also on borders and what borders mean. It's also a book about power and who gets to do what. And throughout the book, he's very conscious of his own privilege in going on this journey. He can flash his Canadian passport. Mm. So it's a very self-aware book. It's just an amazing piece of work and incredibly brave too. And on the fiction side, just to mention an author who I'm really excited to be publishing again, Fernanda Melchor, the Mexican novelist. So we published her book, Hurricane Season, which is a kind of incredible torrent of language about the violence and misogyny of Mexican society and I guess the corruption and horror that is gripping the country through narco violence. It's a reverse detective story. It opens with the murder of the local witch and then Fernanda pans out and goes back in time and through several characters who she presents in the form of monologues we get the events leading up to the murder and different perspectives and unreliable narrators and it's an incredibly dark book. I think pretty much everything that humans do to each other that is bad is in the book uh, I have but it's, heard it's quite harrowing people also say it's amazing it's incredibly gripping and I think the title hints at what it feels like to read the book you are really pulled in and spat out the other end her new book which we're publishing next month is called Paradise which is written very much in the same style you know, kind of a Mexican vernacular Sophie Hughes is the translator and she's a phenomenal translator and this book is about femicide and violence and the internet and it's basically about two teenagers in a luxury condo there's a heist and it all goes terribly wrong and we know there's been a crime at the beginning and the book unravels it and takes you to some pretty dark places so yeah i'm very excited about that book it's called paradise sam you've read fernanda melchor i think I have, and it's really quite an experience. It's not for the faint-hearted. I'm slightly scared of those books. I have to say, he gave me the one he was talking about, but because I'd seen what people had read about it online, I was a bit nervous to jump in. I think even looking at the first page, it's full of the most extraordinary, vivid, but also foul language. There are no paragraph breaks. It's, as he says, a real torrent of language. It's an untrammeled experience. I think there is a bit of a contrast between the first book, Hurricane Season, which it feels is very authentically Mexican. It has things you might associate with Mexico, as he says. There's this subplot about witchcraft. Paradise is a little bit different. It's about a very wealthy, gated community and some terrible things that happen there. 
And a lot of the book focuses on the perspective of these teenage boys. And um, there's always a risk, a bit of a tension in the book that it could tip over into something very crude, almost like a sex comedy twinned with a bit of grotesque horror, as well as a bit of a satire of these super wealthy, awful people. But it's really the language, uh, Melchior's command and her ability to restrain this enormous torrent of unpleasantness and filth that really powers the book along. And I think is why audiences have responded so strongly to it. And Kate, you've read far more of the Fitzcarraldo list than I have at this point. What would you recommend? Well, I haven't read that many. I'm a great one for buying Fitzcarraldo books. I mean, I just love them so much. <laughs> I love everything about the ambition of them and and the fact that they're all so amazing because they really are. You know, there's one thing that's incredibly consistent about them, which is they are all so good. But yeah, they demand something of you, I think. And it's rare that I have the time or the ability to focus that I feel like they need. That said, I'm a great dipper in and dipper out of Fitzgerald books. And I really enjoyed all the ones that I have. I this summer read The Netanyahu's, which is a recent one by Joshua Cohen, who Jacques mentioned at the very beginning that he has published. He's been working with him for a long time. And so, again, it's interesting, this sense of the story of these authors and their works unfolding, you know, within this publishing house is so strong. I had heard it was funny and I sort of thought, hmm, a Fitzcarraldo book that's funny. That's that's interesting to me. I'm curious to see how they do that. So I um, I read it and actually it is hilarious. I loved it. It's a campus novel and it tells the story based on this real life sliver of an event that really happened of this professor in America and he is required to host the Netanyahu family. So Benjamin Netanyahu's father was an academic and at one point he was trying to find work so that he and his family could live in the States and he was interviewing at various colleges to try and get a position. And so this is the setup. You've got the academic who's narrating the story, who's Jewish, and he's required to host this family. And the reason he's been asked to do it is because he's Jewish. And so there's this sort of theme of anti-Semitism that's sort of running very low level through the other faculty members and how they treat him. And he's a specialist. Netanyahu's father is a specialist in some obscure branch of Spanish medieval jewelry I think and and the narrator is a specialist in taxation he's an historian but he comes at it through this very boring lens of taxes and oh, I feel like I'm not really selling the comedy and in fact I myself <laughs> wasn't really getting it and there is a lot of historical stuff there's a lot of political stuff very frequently there are these long letters from one character to another that outlines the situation in Israel and how the American elite were responding to that and as I said, this thread about Jews and Jewishness. And so, yeah, it, it has that classic Fitzgerald element, I suppose, of some kind of, kind of weighty subject matter. But then the Netanyahu's arrive at our main character's home and the comedy kicks in. And at that point, I absolutely fell in love with this book, Hook, Line and Sinker. He has a teenage daughter, Judy, I think her name is, who's just utterly impatient with this whole thing she doesn't want anything to do with this weird family and the Netanyahu's themselves are so odd <laughs> and just <laughs> behave really bizarrely and our narrator has to kind of keep up appearances and he's very worried about his job and his position on the campus and his wife his incredibly long-suffering wife is very funny and there are these set pieces that are absolutely just genuinely laugh out loud funny and the goodwill I felt towards it and the kind of warmth I felt towards it for making me laugh so much and drawing me in with all these characters actually then carried me through the heavier material that does keep recurring. It's a real mix of seriousness and comedy, this book. And the author, to talk about Joshua Cohen a bit, I was completely blown away by his erudition and his capacity to synthesize all of this material and bring it together into such a brilliant book. I absolutely loved it. I raved about it at the time. I've recommended it to people since. I think it's such a great read. If you're new to Fitzcarraldo and you're considering diving in, that actually would be my recommendation for a place to start. Sam, how about you? Well, if I can go from the completely opposite perspective, and if you're ready to dive straight in and go full Fitzcarraldo uh, and go for, <laughs> you know, something that seems intimidating, but really, once you start it, it's not at all. There is a Norwegian writer called Jan Fosser, 
who published what's known as his Septology. So it's a series of seven books, seven very short books, I assure you. They're very easy to get into. It's all about a painter who lives in a remote cabin in rural northern Norway. He lives by himself with his paintings. And the entirety of these seven books is an unbroken interior monologue over the course of perhaps two or three days, where, again, almost nothing happens. So it's very Fitzcarraldo in its kind of opening pitch and picking up in the bookshop. A lot of people might be intimidated. But actually, once you get over the fact that there are no sentences and there's very little incident, there are only a handful of characters and one of them is a doppelganger who may or may not exist in real life. Once you get past that, the writing is really hypnotic, really draws you in, very transparent. It's writing that really echoes the rhythm of thought, really engrossing and contemplative in a way. It drifts in and out of dreams, in and out of prayers, in and out of his practice as an artist. And it can take you to places where I think other books don't. So that would be my recommendation. He's an extraordinarily different voice that you really wouldn't encounter anywhere else. And yes, perhaps it is a little bit sad. It's very inventive in terms of form. But the experience of reading it, it's much more like listening to your own thoughts than being challenged. It's not a book to attack. It's it's a book to get sucked into. How interesting. I hadn't come across those. You know, I sort of feel they're kind of the books for the reader I want to be, maybe more than the reader I am. But I love that they exist and I aspire to that level of reading. It's very easy. It's very easy to just consume easy reads. And it's hard, I think, as a grown up when no one's making you read the more challenging stuff to sort of sit yourself down and say yeah I'm going to read that well maybe unless you're you Sam or maybe if you're Phil I feel like these you don't have these challenges but for me it it is a bit of a kind of I think I think both Phil and I have bookshelves full of these (laughs) these books that are staring down at us but what I noticed is that when I was looking to do a bit of prep for this episode I looked for my Fitzgerald books on the shelf and I noticed that more often than not, the ones I've read were missing because I've lent them out to people because I've been so, this is such a great thing, I need to give it to someone. And I think the best compliment you can pay a book is if you lend it to someone and they don't give it back. Yeah, that's so true. And I think I was so thrilled to talk to Jack. I loved hearing the story. I mean, isn't that just the most amazing story of how he just was so sure about what he wanted to do? He didn't really fit anywhere in the landscape of British publishing as it was at the time. And he stuck to his guns and carved out a role for himself. And look at where they are now. And eight years, I think they've been going. It's just going to be so interesting to see what happens to them next. And I think we're so lucky to have them. I feel proud that we have this amazing publisher who's doing this here in the UK and giving us a little bit of Euro street cred. Yeah, I think Jack was saying it was interesting that authors are now taking their books to him, whereas before we'd have to seek them out. So you would wonder if they might encourage some authors to branch out a little bit and write in slightly different ways as well. So whether for reading for your own pleasure to expand your own horizons or whether for your book club, if you want a book that is really going to give you some meaty stuff to dig into, I think Fitzcarraldo is one that we would urge you to seek out. Sam, thank you so much for joining us. It's been such a pleasure having you. Thank you so much for having me. I think it was a great discussion. That's nearly it for this episode. You'll find all the books we mentioned here in the show notes and on our website, thebookclubreview.co.uk, where you'll also find an episode transcript and our comments forum. Whether you're listening to this episode around the time we published it or are coming to it at some moment in the future, if you have thoughts, you can share them with us there. We love to hear from you. What Fitzcarraldo book would you recommend? Or if you're outside the UK, do you have an indie publisher that you love? I'll also include the link to the White Review interview with Deborah Levy, Jacques mentioned, which is a fascinating read and freely available on their website. And if you're inclined to become a Fitzcarraldo aficionado yourself, you can find out all about them, browse their catalogue and sign up for their subscription service at their website, fitzcarraldoeditions.com. If you'd like to see what we're up to between episodes, follow us on Instagram at Book Club Review Podcast, on Twitter at Book Club RVW Pod, or email thebookclubreview at gmail.com. And if you're not already, why not subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts and never miss an episode. If you like what we do, please also take a moment to rate and review the show and help other listeners find us. But for now, thanks for listening and happy reading. <laughs>